Hello. Thanks for coming. I'm happy to be back here. Uh, I think I was here earlier this year. I think it was this year. Um, interviewing Kim Gordon. And now I'm here to interview you. <laughs> That's, I, yeah, you took over already, Carrie. I, um, uh, thanks for coming. Um, this is very exciting. The last time we saw each other, you actually did a benefit for A26 Valencia, you and Fred. Do yes. you remember this? Of course I remember it. And you performed with a bunch of our students. And what did they, they did the A26 Landia? Yes. They performed a uh, kind of a version. They wrote uh, versions of your skits. And I was wearing a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I can't believe that's not the, that's what I remember, but I like how you remember all the other things because I left there thinking I just wore a diaper in front of a lot of people. So, anyway, um, I, that wasn't part of our, uh, but thank you for doing that. It was, it was my pleasure. <laughs> to wear a diaper at the St. Regis Hotel in uh, and a very fancy benefit. Um, so, all right, let's talk about this book. Um, how, many have we, how many of you have already read it? Oh, all right, just, you could clap. All right. How great is this book, right? Um, let's publicly congratulate you. This is incredibly hard to do, what you did. And you wrote a lot of it here in San Francisco. You were recording No Cities to Love and writing this book. And uh, how incredibly difficult and arduous was that? It doesn't, it's not as fun as you think it's gonna be, right? Writing a book. It's just incredibly, it's an incredible pain in the ass. I feel like it's zero fun. I, like. <laughs> I, 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 the fun, the fun happens when now, I guess, like now, now is fun, but writing it was, was not that fun. Um, yeah, it was really difficult. I did write, I had a lot of it already written when we began recording, uh, No Cities to Love, and we recorded it here in San Francisco at Tiny Telephone, um, which is, uh, John Banner Slice's studio, and, um, we, stayed all together in a, a house, um, Airbnb, which, I know, please. <laughs> I, I knew, I knew someone was gonna boo. I, I almost booed for you before, <laughs> just, just to avoid the one person booing. I read the New York Times article, I, I stayed in the mission, I know, it's messed up. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not, but I'm just telling a story. <laughs> Let's have a soundtrack of booing behind me, just in case I say anything that is sensitive. <laughs> um, so we were staying in an Airbnb in this awesome neighborhood, the Mission. It's like the coolest, whitest neighborhood in San Francisco. <laughs> and, um, and in the mornings before we went to record, I would go to a, a coffee shop and I would I would work on this, this book. Um, one thing that uh, enabled me to be a better writer is that I'm a morning person. It also made it really difficult to be someone that was in a rock band for many years <laughs> because I like to go to bed around 10 <laughs> um, and get up at six uh, or, you know, 10.30, sometimes nine, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but but I, anyway, so it allowed me to, to wake up early and write. And what was interesting um, was that reimmersing um, myself in the world of Slater Kinney really helped uh, fill in some of the details. I had these uh, chapters written and these sections written about the band, and then I kind of felt like I was exhuming this corpse. Like, all of a sudden, we were in the band again. And when I started the book, I was writing about it in, in a way of you know, thinking, well, this is only in the past. So it was really interesting to uh, fill in parts of the book once we started up again. Well, did the band getting back together serve as one of the catalysts for writing the book? Because I don't, well, it's not suspenseful. We know the band got back together. So, um, but sometimes to, to take on a, 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 a book, but a memoir in particular, you need to know the beginning and end, I think, in particular, to get it started because life keeps going. You have to have that end point did that, when you were undertaking it, did you know already, uh, or was it undertaken before the band planned to get back together, or? It, it was, and, and the end was that last, uh, was the last show, 
and uh, in 2006 on stage in Portland. And yeah, that was the original end. And then all of a sudden I had this new end and that actually changed a lot of the earlier content in the book because I felt like, I don't know, it just changed, it, it, it changed the, the tone of it a, a little bit. And I went back and made some, some changes. But um, yeah, that was very strange, but also a relief. And I didn't get the band back together, so I had a better ending. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a good um, idea. But it, it did allow me to um, have a pretty great epilogue for the book. Um, well, let's, let's start at the beginning, though. And so, and I thought we would start with a picture that... Dave is the first person to do this slideshow gotcha thing. The pictures are in the book. <laughs> I know, Come they're on. in the book. They're in the book. So, um, so Even though we... I turned them in, I'm still scared. Like, I gave you these oh, slides. Oh, I like the little fade that they did there. That's nice. So we're going to fade forward into this uh, picture, maybe. Ah. Uh, so, all right. <laughs> So I'm staying at an Airbnb. It's a tire. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. The, uh... um, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is my first professional photo shoot that my parents set up for me. Um, I am uh, I'm at a park um, in, in Bellevue, Washington. And this is the hippest I've ever looked. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've never topped this Kool-Aid yeah, hat. No, that's a high bar. <laughs> what does the, what is the, uh, the hat say? Something aid. Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid, all right. I didn't know if it was Rite Aid or what. All right, Kool-Aid, that is a very... If you could get your hands on that hat, think about what I'm that set. would sell on Hate Street now. Yeah. Oh, look, it's right... We don't even have to you, crane our I was going to tell you that we have Thank a you. screen there, too. Thank you, no. Thanks, so, thanks for... I, they even told me that earlier, but I still... That picture and this one. Oh boy. Okay. So, what Corp you? just shilling for a corporation. Um, <laughs> Peterbilt. Uh, actually, my dad. My dad worked for for Peterbilt in Kenworth Trucks. Yeah. Well, what was what? What you you describe your childhood beautifully here, and and it and it has a very direct through line, I think, to who you became as a performer. But can you you were a performer even at this age? You talk about sort of this. You had you put on a lot of shows at, at home and uh... yeah, this was like my one woman show. I was doing like a lot of hats and um, <laughs> no, I but I was I was constantly I really experienced uh, the world through performance. I had a fairly uh, chaotic childhood in, in some ways. I I was in a family where I didn't feel seen a lot of the time because both my parents were kind of experiencing their own forms of uh, confusion and anxiety and and loss of, of self or not knowing who they were. So it's hard um, to pay attention, I think, when you're experiencing that. So one way that I would make sense of that chaos at home was to perform. Uh, that's is sort of the way I could control a situation. A lot of things felt out of control. And you know, putting on a show, uh, whether it's a play or dancing, ballet, which I never did formally, um, but I did informally a lot. Uh, was was a way of, of creating structure and, and also kind of, you know, taking the attention away from this encroaching sadness onto something that hopefully would be entertaining. So I, the early parts of the book are a, a lot of descriptions of many, many performances. Including the little D. Duran Duran cover band that you had. Yeah, cover band is a generous term because <laughs> um, we weren't, playing any instruments, um, but we were, we were strumming scrap wood um, that we had borrowed from our parents' garage. Strumming scrap wood, I just want to yeah, yeah, underline that. Strumming away on a scrap, scrap wood that we had painted and nailed together to look kind of like guitars. Um, luckily in the 80s, guitars basically just, you know, they were weird shapes. They were just like <laughs> a triangle. Uh, <laughs> You know, or, or like a key tar was popular, and and that's just that's just a rectangle, um, and then <laughs> you just paint it with house paint, so every instrument was gray, <laughs> and um, and then we just hung out on our parents, uh, my neighbor's deck, and we just played along to we just lip synced. It wasn't a cover band again. We it was a lip sync band, <laughs> but I, I was I was the lead singer. 
Even though everyone else was just air guitaring or air keyboarding, I was singing over the music. Because, <laughs> you know, you can if you're in charge. And um, so I, I was basically the neighborhood impresario in a lot of these, <laughs> a lot of these events. And I'm um, like, if my parents had people over, bef you know, and it would be time for bed, I would ask if I could sing an Eagles song. <laughs> um, and, you know, songs about cocaine are really appropriate. Um, <laughs> to sing, uh, you know, Life in the Fast Lane. Um, it's, you know, a common experience for a suburban child. <laughs> that sounds totally healthy. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So this here, this is my, um, my, my mother and, and my father, um, who has a great mustache. Um, <laughs> there were many years when I didn't know he had an upper lip. Um, that's what's... I think that's what... The, it's really scary for kids when... They have parent, a dad, usually a dad, but I don't want to generalize, um, <laughs> with, with a thick mustache. <laughs> and, and you just think that's part of their face. And then they take that mustache off and they have a whole new face. And yeah, yeah I, was, I cried when my dad shaved that. Um, and that's not a joke, I did cry. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, that's me in the, I'm wearing two different patterns there, pretty intense. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, I do have to turn because I'm just making sure I'm seeing that correctly. Yeah. Um, you didn't notice it until now, right? Yeah, no, that's... Seeing it this big, it's really yeah. dramatic and But that terrible. would be very popular today, too, I think. Um, <laughs> and then that's my, my sister, the, the, the smaller one with the barrette. Um, and I had that bowl cut um, for about 10 years. <laughs> 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 uh, this is before my mom... Um, got sick. My, uh, there's, that's a, there's a bit in the book about my mom um, becoming ill, and this, she looks pretty good here, so that's before then. Um, a lot of, uh, especially somebody that grows up to uh, be the musician that you became, might be inclined to fib about their first concert and say it was Muddy Waters or, I don't know, Sonic Youth, I don't know, somebody, something, uh, somebody impressive, and uh, your first concert was Madonna. Yeah. Which, I mean, that would be amazing if I had the wherewithal to say that I saw Muddy Waters. Yeah. Um, or like Robert was, Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think Madonna, I have to say, I, I feel like that's a fairly impressive first concert. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to lie, I may have stumbled into a Raffi show before that. <laughs> But for the record, it was Madonna. I mean, Rafi was just happening in the background <laughs> of a fair, maybe. Um, but it was, it was 1985, and Madonna, uh, Madonna's Like a Virgin came out. And, I mean, that really caught the, the nation by storm. Um, <laughs> I sound like at well the beginning, said. beginning of a music yeah. documentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it... Yeah, and she she started her Virgin tour. It was literally her her first tour outside of New York, and she her first night was in Seattle, and she played three shows at a three thousand uh, capacity theater called the Paramount. Mm. And um, I went the first night, and the Beastie Boys opened. <laughs> oh, we booed them. We booed them right <laughs> off stage. We we didn't we didn't know they were just these these young punks from New York with a lot of swagger and, and hip hop was not super popular in Seattle at the time and mm. we, we wanted to see Madonna um, ro roll around in a wedding dress um, <laughs> which is, it, the, and a wedding dress is what I asked my mom if I could wear to the show Her, her wedding dress Her wedding dress yeah. um, And she said no which I think is the right decision <laughs> I think she called it inappropriate, right? Yeah, Which it was really, inappropriate. I also yeah. wanted to wear... Flash dance was popular at the time, <laughs> too. I was only in fifth grade, so, you know, flash dance is a sophisticated film. Um, it has and many layers. W yeah, and there's yeah. also... Yeah, Jennifer Beals and, and, and you know, it's sexual. <laughs> and, um, and everyone wanted to wear these, real, these off-the-shoulder... Um, she wears, like, an off-the-shoulder gray sweatshirt. And I wasn't allowed to do that, but I was allowed to wear... At the mall, they sold flash dance clothes with a shirt sewn in underneath <laughs> to make it more appropriate. So it was like, it was literally like a baseball jersey underneath, like a three quarter length sleeve underneath and a sweatshirt off the shoulder above it. Wow. And I was allowed to wear that. Yeah. 
But instead, I, um, to the Madonna show, I wore a button-up um, with uh, exotic fruits on it. Mm. <laughs> That's so good. Um, all right, we have to jump ahead. First guitar. First guitar uh, was a cherry red Epiphone copy of a, a Fender Strat. Wow. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> pretty cool. Um, and a, a solid state uh, amplifier from Canada. Um, that I bought, it was the first thing I bought with my own money, which I think I had gone through a, a lot of phases, you know, like I thought I was gonna be a professional tennis player and that didn't work out. Um, and I, I just had other hobbies, I think that my parents had invested in and they were just like, no, like <laughs> you need to buy this on your own. And I am glad I did because it, it made me sort of want to prove to them that, that I was gonna stick with it and I did. And when you first started, did you have heroes? Somebody that you were emulating? I, I know that you liked more than a feeling, so I'm assuming the guitarist for Boston was one of your. Yeah. No, um, but I, were, were, there, were there, was there somebody that you were looking up to at that point? By that point, so I bought my guitar, my first guitar at 15, and I, at, I had finally started listening to punk and indie, and I listened to um, the Ramones and the Clash, and there were a lot of local bands. There was this guy named Jeremy Enoch who went to my high school. He later formed this band called Sunny Day Real Estate. And, um, and he, before he was in Sunny Day, he was just like our hero, our guitar hero in, in school. So he was kind of my favorite. I think when you're young, often like you name these, you name check these people from bands, but really it's just some friend you have that you're like, I wanna play like that. And I wanted to play like Jeremy, and he, and he was the one that taught me chords. I wondered if you could read a page from early on, which is sort of helps illustrate, I think, that period when you were first maybe forming your... Okay, going to the shows, that part? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. In 10th grade, a few of my friends were old enough to drive, and I started making my way out of the suburbs and into Seattle on the weekends. Some of the shows we saw were at big venues, like the Moore or the Paramount Theater, the Church, the Ramones, Sonic Youth, the Jesus and Mary Chain. But most of the time, we'd go to smaller places like the Party Hall or OK Hotel, and we'd see Northwest-based bands like Tree People, Kill Sybil, Hammerbox, Engine Kid, Aspirin Feast, Galleon Slap, Christ on a Crutch, and Positive <laughs> Greed. How those are amazing names. <laughs> Here I, could here I could get close to the players themselves. I could see how the drums worked with the guitars and bass. I could watch fingers move along the frets and feet stomp down on effects pedals. I saw the set list taped to the floor, and sometimes I was close enough to see the amp or pickup settings. I observed the nature of the bands, their internal interactions, their relationships to one another as much as I listened. It seems obvious, but it was the first time I realized that music was playable, not just performable that it had a process and a seed, a beginning, middle, and end. Everyone who plays music needs to have a moment that ignites and inspires them, calls them into the world of sound, and urges them to make it. And I suppose this form of witness could happen orally. Perhaps it's as easy as hearing an Andy Gill riff or a Kim Gordon cadence and knowing intuitively how that all works. Then you form those sounds yourself with your own hands and your own voice. Or maybe you see it on a video in footage of a musician who finally translates and unlocks what you thought was a mystery. For me, however, I needed to be there, to see guitarists like Kim Warnick and Kurt Block of the Fastbacks, or Doug Marsh of Tree People play chords and leads, or Calvin Johnson and Heather Lewis from Beat Happening in the wholly relatable attire of a threadbare t-shirt, jean shorts, enact a weird nerd sexiness, strangely minimal, maximally perverse. I could watch them play songs that weren't coming out of thin air or from behind a curtain. I needed to press myself up against small stages, risking crushed toes, crushed toes, bruised sides, and the unpredictable undulation of the pit, just so I could get a glimpse of who I wanted to be. That's pretty great, huh? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for reading that. I just, the book articulates sort of the entry of somebody into this world, I think better than anything I've ever read. It's just uh, passage after passage like that. And um, uh, I wondered if you could talk about sort of 
that transition from being at home and you're living in Redmond and you're in this you know, suburban environment and then thinking that you really might audition and become part, you know, you, you, maybe you can tell, paint the picture of you being, living at home and then auditioning for Seven Year Bitch, which is like a hilarious story. And, I, and, and how old were you when you did that? I was 17. You were 17? <laughs> yeah. So, every, so much okay. of what happens... I was in, 18, yeah, yeah, but I was very young. You were okay. very young, and so how does somebody get, I don't know, the, the courage to do that at so young? And this is a band that, you know, already had a name for itself, and you know, would, many people would be so intimidated, but you just called them on the phone, looked, up, looked them up, went, went and... Uh, uh, well, anyway, tell, you tell the story. No, I was liking, I was appreciating you telling it. I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I first, when I first graduated high school, I went to a state school uh, in the northern part of Washington. And uh, I, I dropped out and had about a year before I was going to start at an, another state school down in Olympia. So I moved back home with my dad and my sister. And... Um, I felt very aimless. I had this time before I was going to go back to, to college. And there was um, a weekly, a music weekly up in Seattle called The Rocket. And they had a musician wanted ads in the back. And I would read them and, and try to find people to play music with. And there was this ad that said, um, girl guitarist wanted no winky solos. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, no winky solos. I can't play a solo at all. So. Um, I was like, I'm perfect for whoever this is. And yeah. I, I called, and the woman that answered was this woman, Elizabeth, who was the bass player in Seven Year Bitch. And I was shocked that this band that, you know, was on Sub Pop and had put out records was just advertising in, in the local paper. Um, tragically, their, their guitarist had, had died a, about six months uh, to a year before. And uh, so, yeah, I, rehear I practiced their songs. I learned like two songs um, on a seven inch, which is really hard because there's, you know, you can't just hit repeat or rewind every time <laughs> the song ends. You put the needle back to the beginning. And I sat and learned the song. She didn't ask me to. I just thought, well, maybe she's going to want to jam and I want to be prepared. And to, so I was living in the suburbs and she lived in Seattle. And my outfit that I picked out to go there was an oversized Hanes t shirt in white one of my dad's vests, <laughs> and it was so big on me, I described it as looking like saloon doors. <laughs> and cut off jean shorts. Did you just say, oh my God? <laughs> I mean, okay, I get it, yes. Oh my God, I'm not even at the best part. I'm not even at the oh my God part, which is, a Kelly Green J. Crew baseball cap. <laughs> Just put that on backwards and get in your car and drive, <laughs> drive to the suburbs to meet like this super cool chick with like tattoos. And I, I opened the door and she's in all black. I was like, right, all black. <laughs> I mean, that white shirt was just like a beautiful cloud and I was like, oh, hello, thunderstorm. <laughs> I am a big, giant, puffy cloud. And um, she offered me a beer. And I, I mean, I was only 18. And also, like, I'd only ever drink beer through a beer bong in high school. <laughs> I was like, oh, like, you sip beer? <laughs> I, I thought I just had to pound it. Um, and I said, <laughs> I said, no, thank you, because also I was so scared to sit and have a beer at, in the afternoon in daylight. <laughs> um, and we sat on the couch and the singer, uh, Selena, came over and I, I knew I had, I never got a chance to play. I knew I wasn't, I wasn't cool enough for these guys. And um, yeah, so I, I didn't get the job. But I did write them a letter, a pretty uh, maudlin, histrionic <laughs> letter <laughs> that, that compared myself to a young John Frusciani for the Chili Peppers. <laughs> Um, because the reason that they gave me for not getting the job was that I was too young and that they played a lot of bars and I wasn't, wouldn't be old enough to get into the show. And I remembered that John Frusciani had been about 18 when he joined the Chili Peppers. 
Um, so I tried to compare myself to him, even though at the time, you know, he was kind of a wonderkind on guitar, and I was, I just knew a couple chords. Um, <laughs> and it, it didn't work. Um, so anyway, that, that's my story of trying out for Seven Year Bitch. Well, it has a nice ending later, maybe we'll get to, but I wanted to talk about Olympia. So not too long after that, Olympia had this sort of mythic status. You know, it was like the home of so many. It was, for the size of the, 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 the city, it had an incredible influence. And can you talk about sort of making that move and sort of moving into that kind of mecca and being kind of immediately, I think, immersed? I mean, you couldn't walk the, a block without meeting somebody in one of these, you know, uh, iconic bands at the time. What was that like at that time? And what did Olympia mean when you were, when you first moved there? Yeah, so I, I, Evergreen State College is where I applied and knew I was going to go for school, but half, most of the reason for wanting to be in Olympia was because of the music scene. And I had started to listen to, despite being a, a, a sort of <clears throat> adjacent to this burgeoning Seattle scene, which was on, on, you know, basically about to blow up. Um, Olympia had really captured my attention. Uh, there were these labels there, K and Kill Rock Stars, and they were putting out these amazing compilations, bands like Enwound and Carp, but specifically bands like Bikini Kill and Heavens to Betsy. And these were some of the first bands um, that featured these, you know, female singers uh, that saying unapologetically uh, about the female experience and about subjects that had up until then sort of been taboo and hadn't really been included in the vernacular of, of punk music. These stories that um, as a young person I had yet to articulate, but I felt very recognized by these songs and I think a lot of people did uh, by these stories. So when I moved to Olympia, it was partly because I felt like these are my people and they're, they're everyone there. Um, is, sort of has the key to all the things that I hope dearly I can unlock in myself. And uh, so as, and aside from going to college, you know, I felt like Olympia was my education and just immersing myself in um, this scene where it felt like almost everyone had a band or two bands or three bands. And each band had it sort of its own like s strange logic to it, separate from sort of the, the logic uh, of the rest of the bands in America. You know, they were these weird, um, I call them like slight, slight amputations, like, you know, two band, you know, two people in a band or three drummers in a band or a bass player, no guitar. There was a band with seven guitars, you know, just, um, just these, these strange, you know, configurations that were very intriguing and, and um, so unique and, and innovative. And yeah, I, I could not have been more excited. And I just, I sort of willed myself in, into that world and, uh, and, until I was a part of it. And your first band was Excuse 17. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> and, that, and that's how you met uh, Heavens to Betsy. You guys toured together. Yeah, I and actually met Corin up in Bellingham where I was going to college. Before? Yeah. Oh, that's right. But you went to her show. Yeah, I went to her show. And so what's it like, you know, you saw her as a, you know, as a fan, and then suddenly you're touring with her, the, I don't know, a few years later. Everything happened so quickly, it seemed like, and so you were so young. And, and what, I don't know, I guess there's something about Olympia reading about it, especially the way that you, uh, you know, evoke it. It's like this incredibly concentrated scene where people are supporting each other. And you find this a lot in artist communities where a lot of bands or a lot of artists will come up together, and if they're all mutually supportive in a way and sort of wanting the same thing and kind of saying, I'll help you, I'll record on your album and you help. Was it that kind of a, uh, an atmosphere at that time where you felt part of something that was, because we remember, I remember hearing about Bikini Kill, like first album down here, and but there you're in this, you're in the, in the, in the, uh, the core of it. Am I babbling? I'm just sort of going on and on. You're, you're but babbling. I think that you have these moments that are sort of, that where you have the right place, the right people, the right time, and so, and it can have an outsized influence. Were you sent, did you know that that was going on when you were part of it? I mean, you, you sort of sense that, although I think part of what made it so 
fertile was that we didn't, we weren't really able to estimate the influence. Um, and because of that, I think a lot of the energy was sort of incubating and percolating and insular and without sort of an ear or eye to what was happening in the mainstream or even what was happening, you know, in LA or New York. And I think because of that, you know, there was this uniqueness and this ferocity. And um, I, I think that, you know, sometimes I think when you're considering, you know, how other people are uh, looking at you or, you know, estimating who you are, that can start to affect the work itself. And there was actually sort of a media blackout because mm -hmm. there was um, specifically Bikini Kill and some of the early Riot Girl bands, the mainstream media wrote about them in a very unsophisticated way. And it was, you know, uh, to say the least. And so people had decided, well, we're not gonna talk to press. Yeah. And that just created, you know, this perimeter around the city that, uh, so every, people came to us, you know, I mean, basement shows with Elliot Smith or Jawbreaker, who was at the time a big band, they would come, they would be playing these big shows in San Francisco or Seattle, and then they would come to Olympia and play a basement show. Um, Stereo Lab, Beck, you know, these people were playing tiny places in Olympia because it was like, um, like one of the unofficial mottos of Olympia is like, it's the water, but it did kind of feel like people sort of came to, to the city to kind of drink the water, to, to kind of come in and like sort of dip their toe into this creative environment and Beck recorded an album there and people would just kind of come and stay in this very unusual way that um, I think at the time we didn't even really realize was unusual. Mm. But you know, when most bands tour, you don't go to a city, you don't go to Iowa City, you don't go to Topeka and spend three or four days there. I mean, perhaps you do, but <laughs> a lot of times you don't and I think we just didn't, we didn't really realize how special it was. I mean, I think, you know, we were inspired and I think it was a very, um, it, you know, it was amazing, and at, but it felt very normal to us in, in such a strange way because people would form a band on Monday or someone would come into town like Ian Sphenonius from Nation of Ulysses or Makeup and, you know, record something with Calvin at Dub Narcotic and they would maybe, that band would decide to play a show on a Wednesday and by Friday they would have a, you know, an album recorded or a seven inch and yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a strange factory with um, very uh, unique galvan galvanic output, I guess. It was, yeah, I, when looking back on it, it's really bizarre that it ever happened. And well, speaking of combining different bands, so you're in XQ17, Corin's uh, in uh, in Heavens to Bestie, Betsy, and talk about how you, you're, these two bands, you left those two bands and created Slater Kenny. The first time you thought that that might have been something real, maybe tell us about the first time you played together. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah, well, everyone had what we would call at the time side projects. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Corin and then Becca, who I was in XQ17 with, they had a band called Heartless Martin. You know, everyone just had multiple bands. So Side project names are awesome. They yeah. always are. Heartless yeah. Martin, yeah, it was yeah. a great. There was an apartment building called The Martin, and it was a testimony to, you know, heartbreak at The Martin. Anyway, it was like <laughs> such these very self-referential insider baseball titles. Um, or monikers, and uh, so Corn and I with Slater Kinney was going to essentially be a, a side project to these other bands, and um, I just remember coming home one day and on my answering machine, um, Corin had left a message that said, I guess we need a name for this, let's call it Slater Kinney, and people made fun of us because, yeah, it was just the name of a road, and other people were gonna name their bands, they started naming off other roads in Olympia that they were gonna name their bands. And uh, you know, we were like, okay, it's not a big deal. Well, this is just a project band. We're never gonna do that much. But then we went to Australia and we formed the band. Well, you said you went to the other side of the world to, to create your, your sound. And why, why Australia? Well, Corn had just graduated and uh, actually, my dad asked me that same question because I think he, th he was like, I thought you were studying when you were over there. <laughs> and um, that's, this was after he read the book. This was, <laughs> really? Nice. This, this was like his main concern. My dad's in the book a lot. This was literally his main concern. And he, wow. he, also, 
He, he had a question about whether we were sharing a credit card at the time or not, as if he was gonna go back through a file cabinet <laughs> and like look up all my charges from that time. But That's I great. love parents like that. That's he was, such a he, dad he thing. He only That's had so fiduciary con concerns. Yeah. I was like, okay. Anyway, you know, I think, <laughs> I think part of it was, it's interesting that we were talking about the insularity and, and the, the, um, the sort of in, inclusive but also very exclusive nature of Olympia. There's also something very stifling about a community um, that, as I describe in the book, is kind of in dialogue with itself and is sort of unwilling to have a dialogue um, with anything outside of its own walls. Um, it can create something very fiery and it, that you can also self-immolate um, under those circumstances. So I think Corin and I um, consciously but also subconsciously knew we had to remove ourselves from this context which had started to feel sort of less than inspiring for us in terms of what we wanted to do um, as a band. And uh, it felt like there was kind of a, a dictionary within Olympia and there was only a certain set of words. Mm. And we went to Australia so you know we could, we could make up our own. And, and that's when we came up with The Sound of Slater Kinney. I, I thought, you know, people have tried to describe your sound for so long, and I think that you did it better than anybody. So I wondered if you could just read this passage that sort of describes, I think, when you first, yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, Corin was louder than me, so her vocal was the lead by default. But we never really considered one a background part to the other. It was a conversation we were having. She had her perspective and I had mine. Or I was emphasizing her point, retelling it even as I was singing along with her. And our guitars did the same thing, augmenting and counteracting each other. We would get to the chorus and intuitively you'd think, this is the time for us all to sing together, that there should be a cohesion, but instead we would split apart. It was almost an anti-chorus. We weren't trying to form a solidarity with anyone but ourselves. Could you sing along to Slater Kinney? Sometimes, but we just as likely shout over you. And good luck trying to sing along with Corin. Trust me, I know. <laughs> it's nearly impossible. As a listener, you have to decide what to follow in the song, which vocal, which guitar. This way of writing and of singing was something we tacitly understood. We never discussed it. We never mentioned counter melodies. We didn't want to sing harmonies. Our songs weren't pretty, nor was our style of singing. It sounded scarier to not sing together, rarely allowing the listener to settle into the music. Everything in the side of the songs was constantly on the verge of breaking apart. Korn's voice, the narrative, the guitars, so few moments provided any respite at all. If we did sing together on the chorus, it was only after a strange, uncomfortable verse. Yet the result was forceful. It sounded like a tightly bound entity, fragments clinging to each other for dear life. If you pulled one thing apart, it wouldn't even sound like a real song. It was a junkyard come to life. <laughs> we were just talking back there. You were saying that sometimes you'll be at a restaurant and you'll, or, you know, or a bar and you'll hear a Slater Kenny song coming, come on. What, what, were you, what was your reaction? I think, what is this racket? <laughs> it's... Um, I, well, first of all, Slater Kinney is not a, an, a band that people usually play at, at restaurants. Yeah. Um, uh, for, for a reason, it's, 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 a, it's not settled music, and it doesn't yeah. make people feel settled, and it's, um, it's not really background music, yeah. um, I've realized. Um, and I, because of that, I don't, this is um, true. I don't recognize it. Like I've, I remember being at a hair salon and hearing this really fast song, and I just thought, "Wow, this is a really disruptive thing for you guys to be playing while I'm sitting here trying to relax and get my hair cut." And then I realized it was "Dig Me Out." And, um, but it, it just—it has a velocity to it, and. It's scary, and I, it's, it's unrecognizable from, I only recognize it from the inside, I guess. Like, 
I recognize those songs through playing them, but when I'm hearing them back, I'm, I'm unsure of, of how fearsome they are. They're, they're very intense. Well, you say, I can listen to soft songs, but I can't play them. And um, does that have something to do with the performance element to it? Because as a live band, you know, you, you can't experience Slater Kenny without seeing you live, I think. I mean, I think it's just a whole different level. And when did you know that you were a great live band? And sort of, can you talk about the relationship and what you felt when you first saw, I don't know, your first full concert where you were really clicking on all cylinders? I honestly feel like we didn't become a great live band until The Woods. Like that, to me... Come on! I'm serious. For us, I mean, you can disagree, but from yeah. the inside, from the inside, that's, that's how it felt mm. to me. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I think that, um, I know we played some good, maybe great shows before then, but that to me is when everything really came together was when, and I write a lot in the book about going on this tour with Pearl Jam, uh, opening for them after one beat and really having to prove ourselves again after years of headlining our own shows and playing to crowds that really knew us and could kind of, you know, keep us moving along and we could feed off their energy and then all of a sudden we, we were playing to people that were very ambivalent towards us mm. and we had to earn, you know, even the slightest glance from them. And my goal was often to get them to stop eating hot dogs <laughs> and, and look at us and that would be my only goal mm. um, and but it we started to tune them out and look and listen to each other and we realized well they don't know any of our songs so we don't necessarily have to play our songs we can start deconstructing them and that's when we started to improvise and jam on stage and I think that's what made us a better live band so mm. I'm not saying we were I think we were good before that but I think that's when for us it really came together and I thought the tour for the woods and for no cities were probably to me my favorite shows. Well, if you can backtrack and talk about, you had very passionate fans early on, and you were a fan a few years before, so it was a pretty quick turn when suddenly you know uh, you had a sound that sounded unlike anybody else. And can you remember the first time you saw somebody singing along, and sort of the first time you felt like you were playing to audiences that had driven from far and wide to see you, and what, what was that like? Yeah, I remember... Especially you were still 19 years old or something like that. Right, yeah, I was, I was in my 20s by then. I remember a tour where I do remember the phenomenon of people starting to follow us, you know, along the eastern seaboard, especially, you know, because the shows are closer together, the cities are closer together. And there was a group of kids that had attached a set of prosthetic breasts to the front of their car. <laughs> and so we would, there it was the breast car, there was like the boob car right at, at the venue and we knew they were there. And um, you know, and, and so <laughs> there was those guys and then we, there were fans, there was uh, these two guys and we just called one Sideshow Bob. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, we, but those were things that we looked forward to every night. Just these, you know, there's Sideshow Bob, there's the boob car, and there's the people coming to see us. And th that was really e exciting just to think that, because that's the kind of thing that I would do. I would drive from Seattle when I was a kid to Portland. And, I, you know, I had friends that would drive to San Francisco from, for a night <laughs> from Seattle to see a band play. I mean, that kind of dedication is not didn't seem foreign to me. Like I understood, you know, feeling like sound was a beacon that I would just kind of follow and, and show up and experience it and not regret anything, you know, you know, foregoing sleep and everything else. So yeah, I guess I definitely remember people would bring us peaches. There was, there was some tours where people would bring us peaches on the East Coast. I guess I remember all the kind of the oddities, yeah. you know, more so than you know, a specific, someone singing along, or, I don't know. Peaches. Peaches, or, um, or yeah, a girl with a, um, a, there was a lot of interpretations, I think, of um, Riot Girl in particular, uh, involved a lot of um, reclamation, um, and there was a girl that uh, used a, a tampon as a, as a hairpiece. 
And I, yeah, I just thought, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, it was intense. Um, well, after Slater Kenny had been playing for a while, can you just read these, this paragraph where you re-encounter Elizabeth Davis from Seven Year Bitch? Yeah. And I think it's such a nice sort of closing of that circle. Okay. During the next few months, I occasionally ran into Elizabeth at Seattle shows and music festivals like 1077's Enfest. She was always kind to me, but I had clearly become a pest. Later, when I knew what it felt like to carry the weight of your fans' aspirations, I would remember the way Elizabeth looked at me after I'd sent the letter. <laughs> a look of pity, distrust, and weariness. There's a gulf of misunderstanding between musicians and their fans, and often so much desperation that the musician can't possibly assuage, rectify, or heal. You feel helpless and you feel guilty. With Slater Kinney fans, I tried to be generous, but I soon grew uneasy. For a long while, I could share nothing more than the music itself. I think I was too scared to be open with the fans because I knew how bottomless their need could be. How could I help if I was just like them? I was afraid I might not be able, be able to lessen their pain or live up to their ideals. I would be revealed as a fraud, unworthy and insubstantial. The disconnect between who I was on and off stage would be so pronounced as to be jarring. Me, so small, so unqualified. In the early years of Slater Kinney, we played at Seattle's Crocodile Cafe. Elizabeth was at the show. By then, Seven Year Bitch had broken up. She came up to me, complimented my guitar playing, and told me she loved the band. Elizabeth didn't recognize me as the girl who had gone over to her house that day or written her an overly earnest tell-all letter. I was relieved that music had done exactly what I'd always wanted it to do, which was turn me into someone else. All right, let's, let's go to another photo. Tell us about this photo. What was happening that day? You know what? There is a picture of Paul Stanley backstage, too. Yeah. He, he did an event here, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, he's Paul not Stanley. doing that in the picture. Yeah. Um, but, uh, wow. Okay, so this, this inside this magazine um, is the first sort of big article about Slater Kinney ever written. Um, I think this is 1996, um, so I'm 22. And um, I went, uh, this is, I just got back from a trip and my friend picked me up at the airport and she brought the magazine. She, you know, she went out and bought it. And um, so I'm just, I'm imitating. I think they were each on the cover of Spin, all four members of KISS. Um, and inside this magazine, uh, so I, you know, you, you, at, before the internet, you weren't necessarily privy to things before they came out. And um, the, the, the writer had, uh, had outed me and Corin as having dated, um, which we had never told our parents. So um, my dad saw this magazine before I saw it um, and called me and asked if I had something to tell him. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was very strange. Uh, clearly, a few days later, I, had <laughs> I was fine with it, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> And uh, although I look like a child, just like sucking my thumb, soothing myself, <laughs> but it was, it was actually a, a pretty terrible situation. I definitely would have wanted to be able to tell my parents myself um, and not have Spin Magazine tell them for me, but sometimes you, you don't get that opportunity. So thank you, Spin and Paul Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Stanley. You can't implicate Paul Stanley. He's innocent in this. Um, That's what people always say about Paul Stanley. He's an innocent guy. <laughs> He's... <laughs> I have good Paul Stanley stories. You do? He, he's a very good man, yeah. Yeah, I know, I'm not saying he's a bad man, yeah. but I don't think people think of Kiss as like, oh, those little innocent guys. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean in terms of crime. I just mean yeah, in terms no. of like, you no. know sex and drugs and yeah, stuff. Um, sure. And hey, we all wish we had been in the band Kiss. I mean, it's yeah. later, many parts of my book are about how we were so not like a band like Kiss. Um, well, you do talk about that well in terms of form, <laughs> forming your onstage identity. And here's that these guys take it to the complete extreme with seven inch 
you know, platform shoes and makeup and everything. And you guys, and especially, I think, especially at the time, the onstage identities of bands, especially coming out of Seattle, was very, was much more stripped down and less theatrical. But at the same time, you know, there's a, a, a you, you had a, you, you, you still put on like a, an incredible show and you in particular had like a real, a, a very distinct style on stage. Can you talk about forming that? Do you remember and, and like it taking any, uh, I don't know, uh, turns or the process of sort of knowing who you'd be on stage? Did you adopt any kiss-isms and then re later reject them? Any sort of, uh, tell us something embarrassing. <laughs> I actually, you are reminding me that I did see Kiss live in concert, yes. um, but later, it was, they were wearing makeup. It was like they came back and wore makeup. Um, I'm actually looking at this picture just thinking how dangerous it was that there wasn't a head, headrest in that car. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, anyway. Uh, that's literally what I was thinking about the whole time. You're like, talk about Paul Stanley. I'm like, oh my God, where is the headrest? <laughs> and no know. shoulder belt? Um, anyway, uh, let's see. I guess I don't, I did not start out as a, a, with the, the kind of like kinetic performance that I do now. I feel like I was shyer, a lot more, um, you know, so not even self-conscious, just I, I wasn't, I didn't move around as much as I do now or that I would start to do later in Slater Kinney. I mean, here is something embarrassing, I guess. Uh, you're, you're trying and I did, as a kid, I did perform a lot. Um, I did really, I was pretty obsessed with, with Elvis and I really did, um, I would put on performances for my grandparents using their canes as <laughs> microphones and um, I really liked um, Elvis's Leg, leg moves. Um, so perhaps I'm just, this is totally for your benefit that I'm just making this connection, but you know, maybe, maybe my leg moves came from Elvis. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is some of the, you know, this? karate kind of. Uh, oh, like, yeah. yeah. Really? They're in one of your, in the back of one of your albums, you're doing something very similar, and then there's this movie. Oh, this too. one. Oh, I know. Gosh. So, yeah. Yeah, this one. I don't know why I was like showing off my muscles. <laughs> um, you know, here's a story about that record. They, I had not shaved my armpits, and um, <laughs> and for and they they used a really bad Photoshop. It's so blurred out. They blurred out your my armpit hair. Oh my god! But I don't. When I say they, I mean I did. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> like, I'm acting like we had some evil, like, a kill rock yeah. stars. The label Kill Rock Stars did not want any armpit hair. Yeah. <laughs> I was embarrassed because it wasn't a committed armpit hair look. Yeah. It was very half-assed. It was pure laziness. It was just like I hadn't thought it out. I hadn't thought it out months beforehand. Like, months beforehand would be, like, stop shaving and have it be long and flowing and just, like, a real, like, Paula Cole <laughs> statement. Nice. Or the, pre the preparedness would be, like, shave. Just shave yeah. it. It was neither. And so someone took, like, the biggest eraser tool <laughs> in Photoshop and was just, like... <laughs> And we were like, yeah, that looks great. <laughs> and that's, that's one beat. That is on one beat. That's like oh, the back God. of one beat. If you look at that album now, you will see a very shoddy Photoshop job. Wow. Um, well, speaking uh, of... So there's uh, your embarrassing story. Crazy that's, rock I've never and roll told stories, that. yeah. Um, when, uh, so one of the... Uh, we're gonna fast forward a lot to when you guys first went on, when you went on hiatus, you were on tour, you were not feeling so well, but this wasn't like the usual rock and roll implosion and it didn't involve drugs and, uh, and uh, throwing things from uh, uh, motel rooms and uh, death and, uh, and, thing, and you know, animal cruelty and things like that. It was, uh, <laughs> It was a uh, soy allergy, if I'm correct, or, and, uh, and a reaction to it. Oh, no, that... No, you're, you're talking about Brussels? I am. 
That wasn't allergies. That was I had shingles. But I thought it was a reaction. You talk all about the soy, and I'm not a doctor. I, no, the, the I, allergies. We are uh, on a street of many doctors. The, that was earlier in the tour. So okay. now I'm just in Europe, and I have shingles. Yeah, which is glamorous. I mean, it's that's very glamorous. In a word, yeah. It's very, very glamorous, rock and, roll. and um, lots of like behind the music talk about <laughs> shingles and. You had hives too, didn't you? Had <laughs> yeah. hives, yeah. All you know. of the good ones, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean. That's... Scarlet fever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I I'd started having a lot of um, panic attacks uh, on tour um, for like for a, a couple. Of, about a year, but I had um, definitely my body was kind of t- screaming out at me that it didn't like being on tour. Yeah, I would have these allergic reactions, which is what you're referring to, and um, end up in the ER because you know my throat was closing and my eyes were swelling shut. Um, and then, so then I was really nervous all the time about playing, and then I was having panic attacks and um, suffering from sort of alternating anxiety and depression. And then um, we were on a tour of Europe, and I just always felt, I felt out of body a lot on that tour, which is part of um, the way that my panic attacks manifested themselves. Uh, And then I had shingles, and after that, um, yeah, I kind of just, with um, a nexus of physical and emotional pain, just kind of broke down in in a dressing room, which I describe in the book. In in vivid detail. In in vivid detail. but But it's so interesting. I think that, I mean, you went, you guys took a hiatus, and I think that what's fascinating about the book and about your life and your creative pursuits is how much you'll pivot from very different directions. And shortly after you guys went on hiatus, you were home, you were back uh, in Washington, and you took a very different direction, and you became the 2006 uh, Humane Society Volunteer of the World, I mean, of the year. Uh, for the state of uh, Oregon, am I right? Or is it, yeah. And um, talk about that. Did you miss performing at that point? Did the hiatus seem permanent? Did, what was going on when you go from touring through Europe with a band that's been called the, the best band in America, by the way, which uh, Grill Marcus called you, to being at home in a much more sort of taking care of animals and being a volunteer and having that sense of sort of going from a stage and, you know, in front of thousands to this very personal, very quiet and, you know, a position of, of serving, you know, where you, that you were doing. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, that um, so much of this book, sort of each section is, uh, one of the themes is the idea of family or lack thereof and the ways we try to substitute um, for that. Uh, lacking or, or loss, and in in the final section, which you're talking about, um, I think instead of writing about well, this is how I felt after Slater Kinney broke up, I wanted to sort of metaphorically describe uh, in in a pretty intense way, I guess, um, how I was trying to cobble together uh, an idea of family uh, and. It ended up, instead of being stabilizing or comforting, sort of became a locus of grief. Um, and, but I will say that when I was volunteering for the Humane Society, which I did assiduously and very fervently after we broke up, uh, I was relieved. I didn't want to be looked at. I wanted to be as anonymous and servile as possible. Like, I just felt like I was um, serving a greater good and, you know, animals' needs are so simple. Um, and uh, I, I really, I, I love um, the writer Joy Williams so much and she writes a lot about animals and she has this quote about how, you know, so many things that have been harmed by human words are resolved in the silence of animals and I I felt that the whole time. I just, you know, I just dedicated myself to these tasks that I knew, I knew the boundaries. I knew there were walls there and there were needs that were um, 
yeah, able to be met. And that the, the ritual of it, the simplicity, uh, was, was very um, gratifying for me mm. uh, at a time where I didn't want to be identified as somebody you know, in, in a band, because that had become so volatile and so heartbreaking. Mm. So, yeah. So those years were healing. Yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, I guess, it, yeah, 2006. So, yeah, I volunteered hundreds of hours. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I got a Volunteer of the Year award. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I mean, I did a lot. Also, I mean, when you go from, like, playing on stage to thousands of people to literally cleaning shit, <laughs> like, diarrhea just sprayed from, like, some nervous, like, six-month-old puppy, and you're just hosing it down. I mean, it's, that's healing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, we have some time for questions, uh, and they can be about the, the ins and outs of cleaning uh, yeah. cages and the Humane Society, or they could be about music or other things. Uh, there will be people moving around with microphones, or you could... First yeah, question here we go. is in the middle. All right. Hi. Hi. Um, I, uh, as someone who's clearly such a really big music fan and always has been a really big music fan, I'm curious how you got to the place where you could start writing such original music, like so music doesn't sound like anything else, um, to the point where um, you're, you're writing it and you think, oh, this, this is something completely new and it doesn't just sound like my favorite band. Um, how did you start developing that songwriting style to get past the place where you're just copying your favorite bands? Uh I was never good enough to copy my favorite bands. I mean, I just, you know, when I, when I started out playing guitar, I, I, I couldn't play uh, like Andy Gill from Gang of Four. Uh, I couldn't play like the guitarist in Wire. Um, you know, I couldn't play like Jimmy Page. Uh, and Corin and I learned how to play guitar sort of with each other and our, uh, you know, because we weren't trained we sort of developed these chords that were slightly stunted or unusual, and uh, they sort of interlocked and were interwoven in a way uh, because that's, you know, we didn't have a bass player, and, and that was the sound we made. We detuned to C sharp. Um, so the, the innovation, I think, was somewhat accidental, you know, and eventually it became, in, there was an intentionality behind it, but as we started, um, it was because we were learning as we were going along and we um, made do with what we had and we, uh, we liked the angularity and um, instead of trying to fix it, we bore into the awkwardness of it and, and made it beautiful, uh, except that it was also really ugly too, which we loved. <laughs> the next question is right over here. All right, hi. Um, so. Um, I just kind of wanted to ask about how you feel like your gender identity and your sexuality affected your music and your songwriting. Thank you so much. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I only have one way of assessing that, which is who I am. So I don't, I mean, it, th those, those kinds of questions are, are difficult to answer because um, I, it's such a meta answer. Um, my feeling about those kinds of questions are, it affected the experience because I am being asked to talk about it a lot, and that becomes part of the experience. So, um, you know, when I get asked, like, how does it, you know, being a woman, how does it feel to be a woman in music, or how does it feel to be a woman in comedy, or how does it feel to be a woman sitting in a chair? Um, <laughs> I, I start, start to think, well, um, talking about it is part of the experience because, you know, that, that's a, a question um, that I get asked a lot. And, and, and sometimes I, I feel like, okay, here is the album or the piece of work that we just put out, and this is where we want to start talking about it. And then when people would ask the questions, we were talking, we were here. So we spend all this effort, this tedium, just to get to here. And that's where we wanted to start. And so I, I, I have find um, there to just 
be a lack of sophistication, I think, in not being able to start here. So I guess that's, that's how I feel. We've got a question right over here. Can you talk about the genesis of Portlandia? Sure. Um, so, well, first of all, I want to say that in this book, Portlandia is very much in the subtext of this book. I think anyone that reads about my experiences um, in Olympia, uh, in communities that um, professed uh, a sense of inclusion, but ended up feeling quite exclusive, um, very elitist, sometimes alienating to other people. Um, so much of that um, sense of you know, frustration or confoundment, I think, is what really fueled um, Portlandia. And that would, that's where uh, Fred, me and Fred's sensibilities sort of coalesce and trying to kind of you know, make sense of one's relationship to um, their environment, their cities, their neighborhoods, uh, their friends. Uh, so Fred was a fan of Slater Kinney, um, and he was friends with our drummer, Janet, and uh, he invited us to uh, go to SNL. And we were playing in New York that night, so we couldn't go to the show, but we went to the after party. And uh, he was wearing a little button with my face on it, which, you know, <laughs> is either creepy or cool. And. Um, <laughs> And we became friends and we made little videos with each other and uh, they were sort of clumsy and funny and silly and eventually we realized we had a chemistry and a, a point of view that was really starting to uh, come together and, and then we made, we made Portlandia. Next question is up here on your left. Hi. Um, so one of the themes of your book is the relationship between hunger and being a modern girl. And you talk a lot about being a fan and loving and being loved and, you know, the, those Bikini Kill lyrics about hunger and, and sort of desire. And I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. Sure. Well, the, the title comes from a, song, a Slater Kinney song called Modern Girl. Um, and, yeah, because of the, the, the themes in the book, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of... Um, you know, ideas about want and, and need and, and striving for a sense of belonging, wanting to be seen, uh, and kind of fighting against um, not only your own sense of in invisibility, but um, a feeling of, of being disembodied. And uh, that kind of, um, you know, I think sometimes um, people decide early on, I know that I did, that that being detached was was like a point of view. It was like sort of a place to sit where it allowed um, this kind of judgment, and a lot of that judgment was fear-based, and it was just self-protection. Um, and I think I kind of often felt like I was someone that was a little bit headless, you know, kind of like walking around with my head in my hands and my head and that head is smiling, and it's that's kind of weird. And um, there's that's a real divided self. I think so much of this book, and so much of what I aimed for with Slater Kinney or with Portlandia, um, and 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 writing is realizing that I, what I'd rather have is that head on my body, even if it's not wearing a smile, and seeking that sense of of wholeness uh, is. Uh, I guess where where the title comes from, and and where that that want and and hunger is 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 for that sense of um, of wholeness. The next question is right over here. Hi, Carrie. Um, I think you're probably one of the most exciting performers to actually see live, and that. Um, you talked a little bit about the kineticism when you're performing, but it's almost like a possession, I think, when, I, when I've seen you before and you really get into it. And I've had some near misses where you almost kicked me in the head. And uh, was, I mean, I probably would have worn it with pride. Uh, but so I sort of want to ask what that's like for you, like on the inside and like, you know, being in your head, but then actually on stage doing your windmills and your kicks. And then also if you ever actually, presumably accidentally ever kicked anyone in the head. <laughs> Oh, that's your question. Have I kicked anyone? I don't, you know, I don't, 
I don't think, I hope I haven't. Um, I feel very, you know, for, for how uh, out of control it seems, it is, it is very controlled. Uh, <laughs> and it is, um, there is, uh, I love the, reaching the outer edges of, of a stage, uh, literally and figuratively. Um, I like that there are so few moments in life where, um, you know, sort of madness and despair and ecstasy are all sort of sanctioned and actually kind of exalted. And um, I like reaching for that and, and going past it. But at the same time, um, it, it is con controlled. So I feel quite, um, and I don't mean that in a limiting way. I mean, it's, it's very fulfilling and it's very, um, freeing, but it's also um, per performance. And uh, I don't think I've kicked anyone. Um, I, ho I hope I haven't. Um, yeah. I d yeah. That seems... <laughs> I would not want to do that. I mean, I... Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I wondered if you could... We're, I think as a last... Uh, Coda, I, th I wondered if you could read that. I think it's sort of, it's a beautiful passage that sort of, I think, sums up a lot of uh, what you've been talking about. Oh, this, is, this is the end. We're at the end. I'm yeah, I, we're Did looking we're at, gonna, yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're out we're of time. Go, we're going to go out with this. Yeah. Okay. And good lead up with that question. So not, not even an audience plant. This would be really weird if this was just a big paragraph about me kicking someone in the head. <laughs> <laughs> there was one time, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't speak to it because of the lawsuit, but um, no, okay. <clears throat> Long ago, I stopped focusing on performing for the sake of my family, but instead performed in spite of it, away from it, to get out. The bottomless urge I had to entertain as a child had sent me headstrong and hurling myself into rooms, hoping I'd arrive in time to delay or minimize the breakage. Cop, coach, clown, a one-girl Greek chorus there to protect, instruct, and delight. But there was no one I could really save but myself. That's what I mean when I say Slater Kinney was my rescue and salvation. It was the first time I felt I could be vulnerable in my creativity, in which the emotional and psychic stakes were neither futile nor self-annihilating. That unlit firecracker I carried around inside me in my youth, eager to ignite it at the slightest provocation, to detonate my whole being and fill the room in a glowing spectacle, found a home in music. My restlessness and unease was matched by my fellow miscreants, bandmates, collaborators, and audiences alike but more crucially, by a warmth and sustenance. In Slater Kinney, each song, each album, built an infrastructure, fresh skeletons. These, at last, were steady bones. Now performing was no longer about trying to harness a cursory attention or to be a distraction. Slater Kinney allowed me to perform both away from and into myself, and leave to leave and to return, forget and discover. Within the world of the band, there was a me and a not me, a fluctuation of selves that I could reinvent along the flight between perches. I could at last let go. For so long I had been, for so long I had seen the lacking I'd been handed as a deficit. My resulting anxiety and depression were ambient, a tedious lassoing of air. But with Slater Kinney, I stopped attempting to contain or control the unknown. I could embrace the unnamed and the in-between. I could engage in an unapologetic obliteration of the sacred. Singularities had always been foreign to me, and where and who I came from was rife with dualities, a mesh of conflicted and diluted selves attempting to cohere, failing on account of an inarticulate denial. Fortunately, music granted me both an allowance of and a continual engagement with the ineffable. I also, for once, felt a part of something. The, inexplic the inexplicable is its own form of freedom. Belonging is not a form of restriction. We can't name the feeling, but we can sing along. Carrie Brownstein. Dave Agers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>